Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to this module. In the previous module, we had discussed digital humanities and its influence on literary analysis. Today, we will look further into stylometric analysis and the premises upon which it rests. We shall also look at its application to certain works and discuss how algorithms used in DH projects produce universalist notions of the human, the formation of post-colonial studies and digital humanities. Digital humanities are important today as they can interfere in knowledge production in the digital age and the role of colonial violence in the development of digital archives. Stylometry as a quantifying activity has a long and varied history. It also has some role in legal court cases where the accused had been acquitted on the basis of stylometric evidence. Let us try to look at its definitions first. Stylometry is an algorithmic development for the statistical analysis of literary style. Stylometry has been extensively used by the American statisticians Frederick Mosteller and David Wallace in the study of the Federalist Papers to identify the authorship, linguistic patterns and writing systems of its authors. Federalist Papers was a series of 85 essays written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison and John Lay under the pseudonym Publius. Stylometric analysis rests on the assumptions that authors have a stylistic naturalism, Stylometry measures subconsciously inscribed features of a text. Authorship is the underlying textual feature that can be ascertained by the study of quantified formal aesthetics. It works on the assumption that authors have an unconscious aspect to their style that cannot be consciously manipulated but which possesses quantifiable and distinctive features. A stylometric authorship attribution can also sometimes lead to disastrous failures, of course. Don Foster attributed the poem A Funeral Elegy to William Shakespeare using a raft of stylometric approaches. When Foster refused to accept arguments against his attribution, a stylometric work by multiple other scholars pointed to the 17th century playwright and poet John Ford as the most likely author of the poem. Let us take an example of how a stylometric analysis was used to understand the style of the American author Henry James and to distinguish his novels from his contemporaries. The technique of cluster analysis groups novels or for that matter any other works based on the similarities and differences of the frequencies of the most frequently used words. The novels of Henry James form one of two main clusters reflecting the distinctives of his style. Chronological stylometry was used to document the development of his style. A delta analysis which is a measure of textual differences was conducted which treated early, intermediate and late works of Henry James as that of by three different authors. Roderick Hudson, the Bostonians and the ambassadors have been chosen as representatives of the three phases based on their publication dates and similar size. Hoover feels that James did have a style. Also, that the stylistic differences between his novels of the 1870s and those written after 1900s are definitely extreme. Citing R. W. Short, he comments that his syntactic distortions often obliterate the normal elements of connection and cohesion. Grammatically speaking, his meanings float untethered, but they also make his later work more connotative in a different sense. The chronological characterization of James' vocabulary was documented in his early, intermediate and late novels. Zeta and Lota, the stylometric measures that focus attention on words that are characteristic of an author were used. Zeta identifies characteristic words of moderate frequency 
whereas LOTA identifies characteristic words of low frequency. There was significant difference between early and late styles as James became more interested in the psychological landscape and the social scene of his novels rather than the physical settings. The modern phase of stylometry has now been changed by the influx of techniques from the domains of computer science and artificial intelligence. Pattern recognition has become one of the central focus of stylometry. It uses AI techniques like neural networks in most cases of disputed authorship where the discriminating pattern is unknown and possibly difficult to recognize. The initial works involving neural networks with stylometry were papers based on the dramatists. Controversies about Shakespeare versus Fletcher and Shakespeare versus Christopher Marlowe were taken up. It was the papers of Robert Matthews and Thomas Merriam that looked at these controversies using neural network stylometry about the plays associated with both set of authors. Neural networks have the ability to recognize the underlying organization of data which is vital for pattern recognition problems. A neural network needs to be trained on patterns known as training set to distinguish between two authors before it can attempt to classify unknown texts. Two sets, each of five discriminators were used as inputs, an example being values of the ratio of words upon the network was then trained to recognize the works of both Shakespeare and Fletcher from their core canons. In order to solve the mystery of the authorship of the play, the two noble kinsmen, the network added quantitative support to the viewpoint of traditional literary scholarship that the play was a genuine collaboration between the two playwrights. In the Shakespeare Marlowe controversy, the network was trained to discriminate between the works of the playwrights. And based on its suggestion, the anonymous play Edward III was found to be written by Shakespeare under considerable influence from Marlowe. The authorship of Double Falsehood, a play by Lewis Theobald, has also been contested whether it might have been written by Shakespeare or Fletcher. Researchers quantified the complexity of their language to identify the play as the work of William Shakespeare. Like neural networks, genetic algorithms also view stylometry as part of pattern recognition. Genetic algorithms learn by generating a large number of syntactically valid but semantically meaningless rules. The same method was used to determine the probable Italian author who goes under the pseudonym Elena Ferrante writer of the highly acclaimed Ferrante Corpus or the Neapolitan novels. For this project, eight books written by Elena Ferrante were chosen to decide on the style. Domenico Starlan regularly appears as one of the possible authors of the Ferrante Corpus. Seven books of Luca have also been added for the comparison to the books of Ferrante and Starlan. A stylometric analysis of the seven e-books of the Ferrante Corpus in Italian was taken up and each symbol here represents the whole or a fragment of a text of more than one leg characters. The red shapes represent Ferrante's first three novels and the blue shapes represent four volumes of Ferrante's tetralogy. The closer the points, the more similar the style of the texts. So, with these diagrams and the analysis given against them, we can make out that a stylometric text analysis is based on algorithms of data compression and research in genomic analysis. These approaches are taken to identify the author specifically. These DH linguistic analysis allow us to seriously consider that Domenico Starnan could be the author writing under the pseudonym Elena Ferrante. His style is stylometrically close to hers. However, even though stylometry has been widely used, it still requires better methods of visualizing and clarifying 
large scale stylistic characteristics and changes corpus based and computer assisted methods will surely be at the center of much of this work it also becomes important to talk about the social developments that have facilitated digital social reading or dsr and the application of digital humanities methods to it dsr refers to shared reading experiences which happen either online or offline it involves the use of digital technology and media either for reading or for sharing experiences elicited by books manual coding brought out the different emotional registers that reviews like goodreads employ while sentiment analysis was used for analysis at a larger scale these analyses show what readers value in a text metaphors for reading or the ethical positions that readers take in processing controversial books for example several aspects of evaluation as well as some political variables were manually coded and qualitatively analyzed in kiran desai's the inheritance of loss user reviews were found to be much more negative than professional reviews it might have happened like this because the book was targeted for a literary audience rather than the popular one dsr research is reader oriented it focuses on the act of reading itself and not on the interaction among readers not on the digital reading platforms it is the unprecedented access to the readers experience that matters let us take a case study of sentiment analysis on the online platform whatpad for reading and commenting on fiction the case study was based on whatpad commenting practices using sentiment analysis the goal of the project was to test if there is a match between the emotions represented in the story and those perceived by readers this was done by investigating the progression of readers response to a story linking the verbalization of emotional responses to particular text passages the graphs presented here plot the emotional valence of readers response along the progression of this story a comparison of this story sentiment with the comment sentiment it was discovered that positive emotions in this story elicit positive utterances by the readers the intervals where the two sentiment values have extreme peaks or diverge allow to identify text parts that trigger stronger emotions contrasting with the story events this provides a link between textual features and readers emotional response to stories such techniques allow a semi automatic selection of text parts for critical readings and further exploration of reader responses let's look at certain implications of digital humanities these include the critical analysis of the materiality of digital and computational technologies in relation to power embodiment and difference while dh has grown so too has the number of voices making the case for attention to race class gender sexuality and other forms of identity that is we have to chart the ways in which intersectionality has been part of dh to ensure that it unsettles essentialist categories rather than solidifying existing assumptions about categories of difference intersectional digital humanities looks at the specificities of a data set it identifies the layers of difference that intersect with it and use that knowledge as a basis for project design one of the early voices that advocated for a theoretically intersectional approach to dh was martha nell smith who proposes that we must take into account the messy facts of authorship and production in terms of race class gender and sexuality areas of difference as we know are fluid and converge in multiple ways for example kara keeling's queer operating system would take socio cultural phenomena like race gender and ability to be mutually constitutive with sexuality 
media and information technologies. Therefore, design principles and technical specifications should account for influences of difference in knowledge production. For example, the considerations necessary for a project on black lesbian activism would be different from one on the oral histories of Latina trans women. Let us consider how intersectional analysis can be engaged through text mining to a large database of 20th century black drama to examine linguistic distinctiveness of gender, race and nationality. The black stage has been an important locus for exploring the evolution of black identity and self-representation in African diaspora countries. Using the data of black drama, machine learning is used to isolate stylistic characteristics of authors and or characters having attributes like gender, race and nationality as well as the degree to which they interact. This text mining helps us to trace issues like the migration of black Americans from the rural south to northern cities. At the same time, these lists also reveal the true difference among black American male and female authors. Racial epithets used in these plays, often in a derogatory manner, reveal variations of language use based on gender and nation and can also hint at larger discursive and representation issues. Let us look at intersectional engagement in digital humanities through social media, digital archives and project designs. So what are the intersectional engagements in DH project? Jessica Johnson's The Codex is an example of intersectional engagement in digital humanities. It consists of three sites or triptych, African Diaspora PhD, Diaspora Hypertext and Seeing Dark Matter. The Intersectional Digital Archive, Amy Earhart's project, The 19th Century Concord, examines the relationship between Concord, Massachusetts, and American literature and history. The Emory Women Writers Resource Project foregrounds intersectional approach through the way it structures project data, and it includes abolition, freedom and rights, and women's advocacy. Such projects are significant to trace the progress of the intersectionality in digital humanities. In the writing and rewriting of these histories, DH practitioners must situate themselves within broader discourses instead of reaffirming the power of Western academic hegemony. Communicative practices in cyberspace were pitched as a curative to racism because identity construction in digital spaces was seen more as a performativity. And this brings us to the concept of cyber race. Lisa Nakamura, in her 2008 article titled Cyber Race, talks about how digital space delineates race as a social performance. Cyber race gets distinguished from real race by its anonymity its variability and modularity. And this places cyberspace as postmodern because it permits fluidity of identities. The internet is seen as a post-racial space as it is possible to choose a race as our database of bodies, discourses, behaviors, images, resemble all database-driven new media objects. However, post-racial cosmopolitans refuse to turn towards the political economy of digital culture and identities. Bodies must be viewed with technophilic, informationalized societies and cyber race was shaped by the unequal access, limited forms of representation in digital culture and images of race under globalization. Initially, the concept of a post-racial identity in cyberspace fed the desire for control over self-representation and self-construction. Nakamura examines how race ambivalently surfaces as both a celebratory representation as well as a white hegemonic target over internet. Let us now look at how DH 
as a discipline lends itself to literary and cultural studies that reproduce ideals of race and perpetuate a technological milieu that underscores its material effects on non-white bodies. Let us look at how race in relation to digital humanities is defined by white privilege and how it has institutionalized itself in a hegemonic manner by silencing alternate histories. There is a need to critically examine the alternate spaces in the digital humanities space that move beyond the normative ideas of hegemonic power structure of male whiteness. Gayatri Spivak has identified this as an epistemic violence in which unequal power dynamics are perpetuated through the production of knowledge that silences the other in colonial context and this can be a form of violence in itself. Radhika Gajala talks about how the internet poaches territorial metaphors from colonial imagery and how humans interact with technology with a false consciousness that the digital commons is exempt from racism, xenophobia and other forms of bigotry. Critics must address the issue that a racial bias is encoded into the objective rationale of the computer. Let us look at an article by Safia Umoja Noble who talks about the ways in which Google reinforces hegemonic narratives and the ways in which it discursively reflects hegemonic social power and racist as well as sexist biases. The study purports the importance of a critical race theory perspective that decenters whiteness and maleness as the lens through which results about black women are interpreted. Safia Umoja Novel in her 2013 work Google Search Hypervisibility as a Means of Rendering Black Women and Girls Invisible points towards the cultural hegemony within Google's results on racialized and gendered identities. She has talked about the algorithm bias, also about the hypervisibility of black women online. Google search engine results display an algorithmic bias by misrepresenting identity in its commercial search and interest. It does not provide social, historical and contextual meaning to black women who have been historically marginalized and have been portrayed in hypersexualized and racial ways. Cultural images and symbols inject dominant social biases into search engine results by transmitting a coherent set of meanings that evolve historically. The media misrepresentation of black women being associated with pornography are typically seen in Google search results of black women which underscores the fetishization and racialization of black women in the genre. Based on the so-called objective truth of Google search, black women serve specifically as a deviant of sexuality when mapped in opposition to the bodies of white women. The pictures given show one dominant narrative of black women called the Jezebel War depicted in more than 100 years of cultural artifacts. By foregrounding pornography as the most important kind of information about black women, as Google did in the 2011 ranking, these narratives are made more meaningful. We co-construct content within the technology itself by clicking on links and through hyperlinking websites. So critical race theory and critical discourse analysis allow for a deeper reading of what it means for identity to be in the dialectical tension between the struggles for social justice organized around collective identities and the commercialization of such identities to sell ideologies. The narrative of whiteness as normality configures information technologies and software designs and is reproduced through digital technologies. Google search result on black girls point to the commodified nature of black women's bodies on the web and the little agency that black female children have had in securing non-pornified narratives about their identities. 
It shows the visible representation of the ways in which black girls as a sector of society are presented in the process of Google searches. The ideologies of color blindness portent a non-racist worldview and multiculturalism that obscure social and structural operation in computer and information sciences that are shaping technological practices. Keyword searching reflects blacks and women's status online in the constructs of the internet. The internet is a contested space that masks itself as a neutral communication environment, but in reality it privileges the male pornographic gaze and marginalizes women as objects. Critical race theory perspective asks questions about the quality and content of racial hierarchies and stereotyping that appear in results from commercialized search engines like Google. Safiya Umoja Noble talks about how this expansion of commercial control over information and identity deserves attention as identity markers like black girls are for sale on the web to the highest bidder. It is because of these hierarchies forged through the internet today that people and communities use digital technologies in ways that are influenced by their cultural backgrounds, identities and social context. This is what Radhika Gajala, a scholar known for her work in the field of digital media studies calls as techno-cultural agency. Radhika Gajala defines techno-cultural agency as the capacity of individuals and communities to actively shape and negotiate their experiences with digital technologies within the broader framework of culture. It examines how voice and silence shape online spaces in relation to offline actualities. How we become techno-cultural agents reveals how we are placed and in turn how we place ourselves within and in relation to the cyberspace. It clearly shows how our subjectivities are placed within unequal power relations manifested through the hierarchies of literacies and connectivity and how technologies have repercussions not only within virtual spaces but also in our offline lives. Let us take an example of the 2002 film Minority Report that racializes digital information access and production by depicting scenes of white and male users experiencing direct relations with computer interfaces while users of color are relegated to the background and are relatively distant from technologically mediated relationships to their hardware and software. This film by Steven Spielberg dramatizes the ways that the post-millennial social body has become an object of surveillance via biometrics and crime databases. It envisions the future regulation of the criminal body as the work of data villains and the gradual indoctrination of its white hero into the system's critique. The whole destruction process is seen as a part of re-racialization that calls the notion of the whole or singularly racialized body into question. The movie illustrates what the post-colonial theorist Paul Gilroy has called as a crisis of raciology engendered by biotechnological revolution and how black and Asian bodies are significant determinants in fixing the social optics of race as they are figured and imaged differently. Surveillance maps the operation enabled by contemporary informational techniques that continues to racially profile people, but it projects an illusion of color blindness. Let us see how visualization techniques in digital mapping projects portray the racism in the machine, that is the ways in which our digital tools can inadvertently recreate the latent racism and the cultural blind spots in our society. We will compare two instances, racial terror lynching maps and map of white supremacy mob violence in America. The first map draws on the data set compiled by EGI for their report of 
4075 racial terror lynchings of african americans and it is focused on the southeastern united states the visual argument represented by color schemes ranging from dark to bright red references the racial terror and the violence inflicted upon african americans in the region as well as the geopolitical arguments on white supremacy the second map discusses white supremacy mob violence it is an interactive map based on the research of the sociologist munro work who systematically documented incidents of violence in the united states the timeline provides a visual cue that racial superiority motivated occurred continually over a long time span these elements show a strong visual argument of how discourses of white supremacy have been historically enforced through lynching and mob rights however in the grand scheme of racial violence lynching represented only one small piece in a complex puzzle of institutional and structural racism it is important to understand that structural ways of racism and sexism is specific to women people of color and other kinds of societal bias are encoded in algorithms this is what sofia umuja nobel has termed as algorithmic operation or algorithms of operation which we will discuss in the next module in short there should be an intersectional internet infrastructure that resists the oppressive representations from the neo liberal narratives of digital technologies neo liberal narratives of digital technologies and the internet suggest that the web is a panacea for social liberation and empowerment but these ideas are refuted by critical theorists the goal of theorizing an intersectional approach to the digital humanities will heighten awareness of how the global communication infrastructure is not made equally and equitably to all people intersectional analysis examine how digital technology intersects with socially constructed categories like gender class race sexuality etc in a matrix of relations that create conditions of inequality or oppression in the next module we will continue with intersectional digital humanities by incorporating aspects of post colonial dh and south asian dh it seeks to critically engage with issues of colonialism imperialism and their ongoing impacts on culture identity and knowledge production in the digital age thank you